The way I've structured this talk is to do the what, the why, and the how. What's data linkage? Why, why do we do it? And, and how, how might we do it? I'm not going to say much about the how, because that's kind of on the technical side. And I, we're not here to, to do too much on the technical side this morning. What resources do we have for data linkage? And particularly, I'll be focusing on those that the ESRC has been developing. And then move on to give some examples of research that can be undertaken. And this is research for the future. So this is to give you an idea of the kind of goal that the ESRC has in mind when it's establishing these resources. And finally, and most importantly, again, touched on a lot in the last session, what issues arise when planning data linkage? So, what is data linkage? I could have produced a very complicated diagram, but you'll have to just kind of think about the lines that might interconnect things uh, without those lines being there. And I've shown perhaps three data sets. We could be linking four, five, 10, 50, doesn't really matter. And each data set is constructed perhaps in a different way. It might be a data set of information with individual records. It might be information about groups of individuals. Household data, for example. That's about a group of individuals living as a household. It might be data about organizations, firm level data, different types of organizations. Or it might be data about attributes which sit also within these files. So it might be environmental information. It might be the kind of information William Farr was handling when he was looking at where, who was supplying the source of the water in different areas, different parts of London. It might be about air quality. It might be about occupations and some statement about whether an occupation uh, leads to contact with pathogens. Um, whether uh, a, a particular occupation demands physically, um, uh, has, has got physically demanding work uh, as part of the constituent tasks. So all these data sets might be different and we can find all sorts of different ways of linking them. So we can link data on an individual with other data about that individual and then expand the information we have on the individual. We can have data on an individual at a point in time and the same individual at another point in time and we can link and begin to build a longitudinal database. We can have information on households and information about the kind of environment in which that household sits in terms of its air quality. Information on, on organisations linked to information on the people who work within those organisations. So, there are many, many different types of linkage. And I think it's fair to say that the ethical and social concerns that we have will depend critically upon the type of data linkage that we're undertaking. So we, we think a lot about privacy and consent as issues. We'll come back to these later on. But sometimes that's not the real issue. The real issue is about uh, commercial value or fairness, or justice. So I've introduced the concept here of a link identifier. And that link identifier, we often think of as a, a name and address of an individual, or a register number, your national insurance number, your taxation number, your national health number. Or it might be the values of an attribute variable that sits within those data. It might be information on the occupation that you, within which you work. And you're going to link that to information about occupations held in another data set. Why do we want to link data? Well, there's a list of reasons there, which I'm not going to plow through, I'll just let you read that. But I think it's also. Uh, incumbent upon us to reflect on the fact that something's happening in society. Something's happening to our perception about the provision of data for research. I was looking the other day 
at the response rate to the labor force survey. The labor force survey is this big national survey that we uh, it's run continuously, five quarter rotating sample. And it's been, it started in 1975. It was a biennial survey at that time. It moved on to become an annual survey. Now, of course, it's been enhanced and it's the, it's the way in which we uh, regularly produce information on unemployment and employment change. Back in 1975, of those people who were invited to participate in the Labour Force survey, about 90% agreed. Now we're heading towards 40%. So there's been this inexorable decline in response rates, and we're seeing it across the board. And maybe it's got something to do with the fact that we've become tired of responding to questionnaires. We get these phone calls that are a nuisance to us, and we just learn to blot it all out and not to participate. Maybe there's some other reason. But for whatever reason, we know that social survey research is threatened by declining response rates. And data linkage and our ability to make use of other data sources is then very important. So it's not just issues about better coverage, although, yes, I think it's agreed that uh, if you get income data from HMRC, it may well be better than income data that you provide on a survey questionnaire. Or at least it might overcome the problem of item none response to that survey question. Which is strange, really, when you think about it. The, um, there is a survey that's in its third uh, incarnation. It's called the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles, or NATSAL. And it's a very intimate survey, as you can imagine. It asks all sorts of questions about sexual behavior. With very good response to each item, bar one, income. <laughs> People think that's so intrusive. <laughs> The other questions aren't. Um, lower cost is obvious, faster, well, faster with that condition, of course, as long as access can be achieved. And again, it's that reduction in response bias that we're looking at in terms of a way of overcoming the problems associated with declining response rates. How is linkage achieved? Well, the first thing to do when you're going to link data is to think about the need to do that. Is it justified? Is it the right thing to do? And this is where some ethical considerations come in. Is it, are the data that you want to link, are they going to be fit for purpose? Do they describe what you want them to describe? Or are you just doing it because you think it's a good thing to do and it'll give you some extra data and you can play around with it? And, and that's not good science. Good science dictates that we have a purpose in mind, we have some hypotheses, we think hard about the provenance of our data, we think about the governance of the process through which data can be linked, and that leads us to the view that, yes, uh, there's something we can do here which will be beneficial. So that evaluation, link quality, is critically important. That usually comes after the link, but it's worth thinking about the quality before you start engaging in the linkage. How are you going to measure the quality of the data? One of the best indicators, of course, is to look at those records that don't get linked. Why didn't they get linked? What happened? What's missing? Or who's missing? Who's left out in the process? What organization has not had its data linked? Or whatever. The way in which we achieve the link, well, um, as was said in the last session, there's all kinds of techniques that we can use for this. Uh, a lot of databases now come with uh, ways in which we can link across a database or simply tell one database about the existence of tables and records in another database and boom, it just magically happens. As academics, I think we like to have a, as much control over that process as we possibly can. And there it's uh, in the language of Stata uh, and with other software tools that uh, we can look at um, either in SPSS or SAS. There's lots of uh, functions, algorithms, routines that we can bring together which can perform all sorts of tasks about concatenation, about uh, identification, about rearranging 
uh, records about rearranging character fields, etc., which will help in the link process. Some of these are free. The uh, Stata Ado Rec Link 2 is free. Uh, some of them you pay for, um, but they all do different things and uh, uh, will achieve links to different degrees of, with different degrees of uh, success. And again, it's looking at the indicators of success, the false positives, the false negatives, the link success, the link bias, that's really important when we're using linked data. It's no good handing over a survey data set to an organization that says, we've got some data we can link to your data, and they hand you back your survey data with lots of records with additional data linked to it. And you think, wonderful, I'll discard all the ones that aren't linked, and I'll now work with the linked data. What are you doing? What are you working with? How did that link process work? How has it been generated? What bias has been introduced in the process? So what are the major resources that we can turn to if we want to engage in linkage? And I think the one I'd pick out above all else here that I've been um, marginally involved in for some years now is the Administrative Data Research Network. And it's been great to see that network set up. It arose out of a task force report uh, published in 2012. And uh, that task force report recommended that there should be a large block of money provided by government for this network, and that was forthcoming. And that there should be a centre set up in each country of the United Kingdom. That's happened. And we've got representatives of uh, some of those centres here today. That there should be close links with the statistical authorities in each country of the UK as part of the network. And that's been achieved. That there should be a service, the administrative, administrative data service, that helps to glue the whole thing together and acts as the kind of forward-looking, the, the front face, if you like, of the network. And there should be strong and independent governance arrangements for this process, which have been achieved through the UK Statistical Authority. There's also resources available in uh, CLOSER. CLOSER is the cohorts and longitude... Oh, I always forget what it stands for. CLOSER. If you put CLOSER into uh, Google, it'll come up on the first page. Uh, this is a network that's been formed for the uh, cohorts and long, major cohorts and longitudinal studies in the UK. Not all of them, but about uh, eight or nine of them in total. And they are sharing experience. And a lot of their work is about the way in which those longitudinal data, which are primarily collected by survey methods, how might they be enhanced? How might they be extended through data linkage? And a prime example of that is the one they're called LSYPE, the Longitudinal Study of Young People in England, where uh, young people who were um, uh, 14 uh, years old um, uh, were tracked for about uh, seven years as they uh, progressed through schooling. And now we're at a point where the study is being taken forward through data linkage. And that means going back to these people and getting their consent for linkage and then going to the data holders and saying, look, we've got consent for us to add this person's record onto here. So it's a study that's being taken forward by data linkage, but had its roots in a survey approach. More on methods for data linkage. Well, of course, this event and other activities uh, run by the National Centre for Research Methods uh, are there for you to uh, engage with and take advantage of. Or you can just use a, what I call a do-it-yourself approach if you're confident enough. And there's all sorts of papers out there on the web that can help you to uh, undertake linkage. I've put up here two examples of major research resources which have been created via data linkage. And the first one it's called the MOJ HMRC DWP Data Linkage, Ministry of Justice, uh, Revenue and Customs, Work and Pensions. 4.3 million offenders 
and they've received at least one caution or conviction for a recordable offence between in this 13-year period, and they've been matched to at least one benefit or, or P45 employment record. So again, you, know, you read that carefully and you think, OK, who wasn't matched? And are they different? And that's a question that I've put to this group, and it's still being answered. But the data that they've created is an enormous and valuable data set, and it tells you a lot about the process through which people, particularly those who've been incarcerated for a period, how do they get back into the labour market? How does the benefit system aid them or hinder them in that process of regaining a toehold in the labour market after a period of incarceration? And it's grim reading the report on this, as you'd expect. But it's vital information if we're to do something about the reintegration of those who've been uh, in prison for uh, a recordable offence. Older than that, much older than that, are the census longitudinal studies, particularly that for England and Wales. And it started life with the linking of about half a million uh, people who were selected, and not, not randomly, but according to um, their birth uh, day. Uh, so four birth days were selected. So think about your four 365th. That's the kind of percentage. So about sort of one point something percent of the population who responded to the census in 1971 in England and Wales. Their records were traced through and linked to their 1981 census record. And in between, there'd been various things called life events, uh, births, uh, marriages, or the deaths of some of those people recorded in 1971. And all that information was linked in as well. And again in 1991. And again in 2001. And now in 2011. So we've built this enormous resource. And now we can start looking at this and thinking, OK, are there other data sets that could be linked to this? So this is something that the Office for National Statistics has been considering for some time, has actually matched DWP records to this database, but then decided that they didn't have a legal right to do that, so they had to scrap it. But it can be done. That's what they learned. In Scotland, uh, things have been done rather differently, started somewhat later, but uh, thanks to the uh, sterling work done by uh, Paul Boyle and others uh, at the, uh, center, uh, with the, uh, uh, the Scottish Longitudinal Study, um, we're now, I think, in a, perhaps a better place in terms of data linkage to that study than we are in England and Wales. And in Northern Ireland, again, uh, similar uh, activities have been taking place. So these are creating resources. They're there for people to use as research resources. But, and I think this is really one of the driving forces for the ESRC behind data linkage. This is a graph, and you can see on the vertical axis millions of pounds <coughs> per year spent on the investments in data infrastructure. And there's various lines there sitting along the bottom, which we're not worried about. And there's two others there. One is on services, and services is things like the UK Data Service, the uh, Administrative Data Research Network, where there's been a huge boost to expenditure in those areas uh, over the last uh, two years at least. But on the services side, now beginning to fall away a bit. But there's one line that's just going up and up and up, and that's the expenditure on longitudinal studies from the ESRC. And of course, it's inevitable. If you start a longitudinal study, you want to track people again and again and again. So you've mortgaged yourself to the future when you've started a longitudinal study. So now the only way out of this, because there's no way that we're going to see 30, 40, 50 million pounds a year coming from business innovation and skills, uh, coming through the uh, expenditure review, the spending review, there's no way that we're going to see the ESRC gaining that kind of money. So the only way forward to sustain many of these longitudinal studies is to rethink 
how they're being sustained or to replace them with other forms of studies. So rethinking and replacing, how might we do this? Now this is my personal view, I don't want any of you to think that this is the ESRC policy at the moment, but this is the way thinking is going. What is it that we don't have? And the one thing that we don't have in the UK, which has been enormously valuable in the US, is a linked employer-employee database. Yes, we've got the Workplace Employment Relations Survey, but quite honestly, you know, 2,000 firms uh, and 20,000 uh, employees. Yes, it's kind of good to get your teeth into, but it's not telling us much about the long-term dynamics of people moving between firms, between organisations, into different jobs, and the success or otherwise of these moves. We know something major and structural is taking place, not just in our economy, but in many westernised economies. And it's what we call the hollowing out of the middle ground of the skill structure. That is, that technology has effectively replaced a lot of jobs which were kind of low to medium skill. Clerical work, for example. Clerical work, you have to think back 30, 40 years, and you could have rows of accountants sitting there balancing books, working away, doing what can be done now in milliseconds, microseconds, on one spreadsheet. And yet the area where we can't bring technology to bear with any success in terms of productivity is in the service sector, in cleaning, in catering, in all of these areas where we rely very much on uh, human skills, uh, human presence. So what we've seen is a move away in our economies towards a growth of the high skill sector, a growth of low skilled jobs in the service sector, and we desperately need to know What's going on? How is this impacting upon people and households? And it's only by having this linked data of people moving between firms, organisations, looking at their occupations, a sectoral change, it's only then we can do that. They can do it in the States, and they've done some pretty good research there over the last five years particularly. They can even track the impact of science spending by looking at the science spending from universities, tracking it through the companies that receive the money, looking at the onward spend, looking at the people employed within those companies, and then looking at how they've moved and evolved. And looking also at the beneficiaries of research in terms of those people who've been engaged in research projects and have moved on elsewhere. And we just can't do that in the UK. <coughs> the other thing that we could think about doing, and this really is thinking ahead to a time when our major household panel, Understanding Society, is becoming a bit long in the tooth. This was started now about five years ago, and already it's having a sample replenishment. But we can't keep on replenishing the sample, nor can we probably keep on affording to run Understanding Society. Now, there'll come a point in time when attrition means that something has to be done. And that's a critical point then, uh, which we will have to think about. How might it be not just replaced, maybe supplemented, or even enhanced through data linkage? And we can take a lesson then from the census longitudinal studies, and we can even think about how the core information in our census longitudinal studies could become the foundation for a household panel in the future. But I think most excitingly, and this is an area that I'm really, uh, I find uh, tr tremendously I interesting. I wonder if any of you have um, played the game Sim City. And it's a bit old hat now, but uh, when it first came out, it was, it was kind of inventive. And you kind of fiddled around with people and houses and transport, and you're the mayor, and you, know, you can do things that Boris can't do, and you can do all sorts of, well, yeah, probably not. Um, but, um, what we are now approaching is a situation where we have so much information in the urban environment that if we could find a way to marshal it, to bring it all together, and if we could overcome the problems of data ownership, data access, the legalities, etc., we can start building models of our cities 
which are not just the three-dimensional spatial models that um, uh, people at UCL CAS have been doing, um, not just the models of air quality that the uh, Meteorological Office has been doing, but models of our cities and the people working within them, their social networks, the way they communicate with each other, how things that happen within the city impact upon them. I mean, take today, we know from personal experience that it's more difficult to get to work. But what's the ultimate impact been? We just don't know until maybe two, three, four, five, six months from now, we'll see a blip in our national income accounts, which is associated with a fall in production on this particular day, because London slows down. But we need to know more than that. We need to know how it's happened, why it's happened, and we need to have strategies to mitigate against its worst impacts. And it's by modeling the urban environment that we'll find that out. Now, this is happening in places like the Center for Urban Science and Progress at New York University, uh, that uh, our university is linked with. Uh, but it's also got, uh, it's reflected in the work that's taking place on what we call phase three of the, 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 the big data spending from ESRC with uh, various centres which are being set up, one in Glasgow particularly, uh, but also the um, Centre for uh, Consumer Data Research. All ways in which we're kind of trying to bring together the information that we have in useful ways and a city focus, an urban focus for that, I think is really interesting. So I think, getting to the last slide, what are the issues that arise from data linkage? I've talked about the first one, the provenance of the data, coverage, accuracy, timeliness. These are really important. We have to know this before we engage in linkage. Access is a real big problem and access raises issues about the legality of what you're trying to do it raises issues about whether uh, those who control this data have got the resources to enable you to uh, take the data or link to their data it's about process can you convince people that you have uh, sufficient safeguards in place that what you're doing remains legal and above all else, it's about the culture of data sharing. And I think there's no better example of this than two government agencies, well, two agencies that work to collecting data within the higher education sector. UCAS is one of those. The university's college is an admissions system service. And HESA, the Higher Education Statistical Agency. Both collect information on people who are engaging with the higher education system. UCAS has information at the individual level on applicants to higher education. HESA has information at the individual level on those people who gained a place in higher education. So if you go to HESA and ask for a data set, they will ensure that it's suitably anonymized, that they've removed the names and addresses, and they'll sell you the data. It's quite expensive, but it's quite useful. You go to UCAS and ask for that same information with names and addresses stripped out, and the answer is no. You can't have it because UCAS wants to ask everybody that they have given their consent for their data to be used for research purposes by third parties. So UCAS falls back on consent, he's a doesn't. Which is right? Well, neither of them because there is no legal requirement that consent has to be given a lot of what we're doing especially in the administrative data research network is looking at ways in which we can link data without consent in the area of health data there is a legal gateway under the NHS Act and section 251 is a legal gateway within that legislation that allows you under prescribed circumstances to link data without consent. We have no such gateway in the social and economic world. So we're looking to create one. And some of you know, there's been discussions underway at the cabinet office for the last year, looking at what's been called a data sharing bill 
And it's actually been produced as a bill. It's not gone before Parliament yet, uh, and I don't think it will in its present form. And it's got various strands within it. One is to allow HMRC to share data more readily. One is for the Office for National Statistics, for them to uh, gear up for the 2021 census via data linkage. Another one about fraud, error and debt and processing data to try and reduce fraud, error and debt. And critically, one strand about research and statistics. And this strand of, if it becomes legislation, would give the gateway for the social and economic world to have a process, a procedure through which it becomes legal for them to share and link data. So I'm really looking forward to the progress of that particular strand. We don't know whether it will go forward in this parliament or the next. We don't know whether it will survive uh, scrutiny in parliament, even if it reaches parliament. But it's an important piece of legislation. It's countered by what's happening at the European Union level, where the view is that you really ought to have consent for any kind of data linkage or data sharing. And so the draft European Union data protection uh, regulation, which would supersede our Data Protection Act if it comes into force, that has been uh, a real struggle uh, for the research community to convince uh, European parliamentarians, uh, European Commission people, and many other people who've been engaged in the drafting of this legislation, that there has to be a gateway through which we can engage in non-consented data linkage. That's been difficult because it, has, it raises all kinds of ethical concerns if you have not got the consent of individuals. And you have to ensure that uh, names and addresses are uh, not revealed to the researcher, that they're not part of a data set. But we as researchers don't want to know the names and addresses of individuals. That's just for linkage purposes. So if we can have ways in which we can keep data secure uh, and we can be sure that the way in which data are going to be used is appropriate, correct, uh, and respects the privacy and the confidentiality of individuals, then I think we have every chance of seeing an amendment uh, being brought through on the European side that will retain our right to engage in non-consented data linkage. Ethics. We touched on this very much in the previous presentation. And I'm working with the OECD on a group that's looking at the, or setting guidelines, international guidelines for the ethical use uh, of uh, new forms of data being used for research. And by new forms of data, what we mean, some of them are not new, what we mean is data which were not originally designed for research purposes but have got research value. So it might be social media data, it might be administrative data, it might be information coming from satellite imagery or from um, uh, the street corner video cameras. There's research value in all these kinds of information and having ways in which we know how to use them appropriately to respect the rights and the privacy of individuals and organisations is really important. And I think we've kind of missed a bit of a trick here. We should have been on to this from the word go. And in fact, the commercial sector has kind of moved ahead here. And I'd be very interested to read uh, some of the links that were put on the screen earlier from IBM and from other organisations as well to see what we can learn from that. And how can we incorporate the best practice that's being developed within the private sector? But also, how can we avoid some of the problems that are arising in the private sector as we move forward in the research arena? So that's my last slide, which is just a list of uh, organisations. I point to the fourth one down. The FAR Institute is set up to do essentially what the Administrative Data Research Network is doing, but using medical data. It's much more, um, how can I put it, research driven than resource driven, but it's an uh, important development and in some of the locations where we have an administrative, administrative data research centre, the FAR Institute is co-located and I think that's a great move uh, in terms of developing the expertise and the sharing as we bring better linkages between health, social and economic data because essentially 
That is the future of social science. Thank you.